Hello, my changelings, and welcome to tonight's video. Um, I looked ahead for the continuation for the uh, Envil case, so um, it does not return back to them talking about the case, so that was a waste of time, and I'm sorry. So instead, because I looked through the tractor before I can, before starting it tonight, which is going to be Chapter Three, Annabelle. Annabelle, uh, from this, again, from this book, Ed and Lorraine, and it's their version that we saw a glimpse of in the beginning of The Conjuring, and not this one, unless this is like uh, a made-up origin story of Annabelle, but, uh, <clears throat> and here is a uh, Ed and Lorraine's story of Annabelle. So, <clears throat> so we're going to start that tonight. Until I get, like, uh, I'm hoping for some, I go out this week and get some black candles. But anyways, um, let's, uh, let's start this. Uh, chapter 3, Annabelle. When the telephone rings at the Warren's house, a somber tone cler uh, clergyman on the other end of the line asks for Ed, Warren. There's a better than even chance that something serious has happened, such as such was the case with Annabelle. The referral this time came from an uh, I Googled how to pronounce this a a pescolo. Pesquilio? Ugh. I'm sorry if I'm butchering it, but I'll spell it out so that way you guys can try to correct me on this. Uh, e P I S O. Wait, hold on. Sorry, I missed the letter. E P I S C O P A L. Priest. Calling from the church's administrative offices in Connecticut, the clergyman was relaying a message he had received from a minister elsewhere in the state. Though the information the priest had was sketchy, he nonetheless told Ed Warren that two young nurses had communicated with what they took to be a human spirit. The priest, doubt, uh, the priest doubted that was the case. However, because the plea of hope included the fact that one of the girl's friends had been attacked physically, though the wounds were not serious, activity was still in progress, and one of the girls seemed to think there was something alien inside her apartment. Would you, he asked, investigate the case further as and as a demonologist recommend if any formal church action should be taken. Agreeing with the clergyman's assessment that something of a negative spirit nature might conceivably be at work, Ed Warren accepted the referral with that the priest gave Ed the phone number and the names of the two young women. After speaking with the priest... Uh, Ed immediately called the number he had given. Upon reaching one of the nurses, Ed verified the, ex the existence of the problem and told the young women that he and Lorraine were on their way. Through traffic was, uh, though traffic was light on the interstate that day, it took the Warrens well over an hour to reach the address of the Morton Low Rise Apartment Complex. After parking the car, the Warrens walked up to the front, to the front door, and Ed rang the door um, rang the bell. Uh, he carried with him a tape recorder, camera, and a black a check uh, case. Footsteps soon approached from inside. Bolt locks were unsnapped, and the door was wide was opened by, uh, Dere. Bernard, an attractive but somber-faced young lady of 25. Uh, Ed and Lorraine Warren introduced themselves and were then ushered into the apartment. 
The young nurse led the Warrens through a spacious living room into the kitchen, where Cal Rand Randell and his fiancée Laura Clifton sat at the table drinking coffee. Uh, Dyra, I'm hoping, I'm still hoping I'm pronouncing this right. Uh, Dyra, uh, introduced the Warrens to them, but the young people said very little. The serious, drawn look on their faces said it all. The Warrens then took a seat with the others at the table. After loading a cassette into the recorder, Ed switched on the machine and Enter the time, date, address, and full names of the principals. Okay, Ed, Ed began. I'd like to hear the whole story right from the beginning. Who here can tell me? I can, said Diary. All right, Cal. Laura, please add any details she leaves out, Ed directed. There are two stories, really, Diary said. One that that began earlier in the week with Cal, the other ones about Annabelle, but I suppose they both, both about Annabelle, I'm not sure. Who's Annabelle? Ed prompted, promptly asked. She belongs to Diary, Laura replied. Belongs? Quest, uh, questioned Lorraine. Is Annabelle a living? <clears throat> Is Annabelle alive? Breathing being? Is she alive? Diary uh, repeated quizzically. She moves. She acts alive, but no, I don't think she's alive. Annabelle's in the living room, Laura pointed across the table. She's sitting on the sofa. Lorraine looked over to her left into the living room. Are you talking about the doll? That's right, Laura replied. That big Regni Ann doll. That's Annabelle. She moves. Ed got up and walked into the living room to inspect the doll. It was big and heavy, the size of a four-year-old child, sitting with its legs stretched out on the sofa, and um, the black pupilless eyes stared back at him, while the painted unsmile gave the doll an expression of grim irony. Looking it over without touching the thing, Ed then returned to the kitchen. Where did the doll come from? Ed asked diary. Diary. Uh, it was a gift, she replied. My mother gave it to me on my on my last birthday. Is there some reason why she bought you a doll? Ed wanted to know. No, it was just something novel, a decoration. The young nurse answered. Okay, Ed went on. When did you first start noticing uh, activity occur? About a year ago, she said. The doll started to move around the apartment by itself. I don't mean it got up and walked around or any or any such thing. I mean, when we'd come home from work, it would never be quite where we left it. Explain that part a little more, Ed requested. After I got, got the doll on my birthday, she explained, I put it on my bed each morning after the bed was made. The arms would be off to its side and its leg would be straight out, just like it like it's sitting there now. But when we come home at night, the uh, arms and legs would be positioned in a different gesture. For instance, its legs would be crossed at the ankle or its arm would be folded in its lap. After a week or so, this made, me, made us suspicious. So to test it, I purposely crossed its arm and legs in the morning to see if it really was moving. And sure enough, every night when it come when we'd come back home, the arms and legs would be uncrossed, and the thing would would uh, be sitting there in different uh, be sitting there in any of a dozen different postures. Yeah, but it did move move than that. Laura put in the doll also changed rooms by itself. We came home one night, and the Annabelle doll was sitting in a chair by the front by the front door. It was kneeling. The funny thing about it was when we tried to make the doll kneel, it would just fall over. It couldn't kneel. Other times we would find it sitting on the sofa on the sofa. Although when we left the apartment in the morning it'd be in dire 
uh, uh, Dearest room with the door closed. Anything else? Lorraine asked. Yes, she said. It would leave us little notes and messages. The handwriting looked to be that of a small child. What what the notes say? Uh, questioned Ed. It would say things that meant nothing to us, she answered. Things would be written like help us or help Cal, but Cal wasn't in any kind of jeopardy at the time. And who us was, we didn't know. Still, the thing that was weird was the note would be written in pencil. But when we tried to find one, there was a, there was not one pencil in the apartment. And the paper it wrote on was parchment. I tore the apartment, uh, I tore the apartment apart looking for the parchment paper. But again, neither of us had any any such thing sounds to it sounds like someone had a key to your apartment and was playing a sick joke on you ed stated flatly that's exactly what we thought she said so we did a little thing that put um so we did little things like put marks on the windows and the door or re, or arrange the rug so that anyone who came in would leave a trace that we could see but no, but never once did it turn out that there was a real outsider intruder. Oh. <clears throat> Alright, so that's where I'm going to leave off for tonight. And tomorrow night we shall continue on. So good night, my strangelings.